So we are welcoming Marianne Favan today, and Marianne is a research forester with the USDA Forest Service out of the Northern Research Station. Marianne received a PhD in quantitative silviculture at the University of Maine in 1991. She spent 14 years in academia at the University of Maine and West Virginia, Virginia University teaching silviculture and forest stand dynamics before joining the USDA Forest Service in 2004. Marianne's studies focus on integrating silviculture to mitigate invasive species impacts and devising stand rehabilitation guidelines for forests degraded by natural and human disturbances. And today, Marianne's going to um, talk to us about some research she's conducted managing understory phagus granifolia for promoting beech bark disease resistance in northern hardwood stands. Welcome. Great. Thank you, Megan. Uh, and thank you for inviting me and the Forest Gene Conservation Association to uh, give this presentation. I uh, had never heard of you guys, so I took a look at your website, which is very impressive. And uh, I hope that some of the information I'll be presenting is useful to your, meeting your objectives of protecting genetic diversity, conservation and management for improving forest resilience to human and natural disturbances and threats. Um, what I'm going to do is first provide some background on American beach silvix management options and uh, the beach bark disease complex. And then I will report some findings of a study where we use silviculture silvicultural practices to try and increase beech bark disease resistance and regenerating forests. And I also want to acknowledge my uh, co-authors and colleagues uh, who were instrumental in the study. In fact, they initiated it. Uh, Andrea Hilly, also with the Forest Service, uh, recently retired from the Allegheny National Forest as a silviculturist. And Richard Turcott uh, with Forest Health Protection State and Private Forestry Division of the US Forest Service. All right. I think the main reason all of us are here is to discuss how beach overabundance in forest understories hinders growth of other species. And of course, that reduces biodiversity and reduces the future ecological and economic potential of the forest. Uh, beach's high shade tolerance and primarily regeneration via root sprouts uh, gives it a competitive advantage when a canopy disturbance combines with uh, things like deer browse pressure or um, on other preferred species. Beech is not as tasty to white-tailed deer, and so they tend to eat everything else first. Um, and I just want to, uh, as a disclaimer, say that herbicides are used, play a big role in uh, beech silviculture. And I'm going to be talking about herbicides, but I just want to say I'm not an herbicide expert. So no technical questions, please. Oh, now we're working again. Okay, so here's an example of a, a dense beach uh, understory. Uh, this is actually in my woodlot in West Virginia. You can just see that the shade and the fact that not much is gonna grow underneath it. Uh, and this is an example of uh, a mid-story beach. Um, so that provides just a, sort of two layers of shade. You've got the understory and a mid-story. And you can also see how uh, beech develops from root suckers, big trees from root suckers. Some commonly tried understory remedial treatments um, are mechanical, you know, just cutting it. Um, fire has been tried mostly experimentally, um, but it requires repeated burns and over many years, I think the longest study, the most successful study, it took like nine years and several fires to actually you know, reduce the amount of beech. Uh, of course, burns affect other species. Um, in our part of the world here, uh, it's, we use it to, to control oak, um, to promote oak, I'm sorry. And uh, so discriminating against beech in favor of oak, fire, you know, fire is a good thing. Uh, the most common control treatment is broadcast application of foliar herbicides, um, which is not selected for beech, so it will kill everything else. Um, but it's still, it's the only way to really get rid of it. Cut stump treatments plus herbicides 
uh, is useful for treating mid-story beech. Uh, it's not feasible for treating seedlings. Um, so you, you cut the stump and that's anything 2.5 centimeters and greater. Uh, the herbicide must get in the camium. So immediate application at, right after you cut it is best. However, research has shown if, the, if it's moist enough, high enough humidity, you can go up to 96 hours delay um, before you paint the stump. And then combining broadcast herbicide with cut stump treatments is, is the most typical way. And I just wanted to point out a reference by uh, Kokenderfer et al. in the Northern Journal of Applied Forestry. Uh, he did some uh, really good research on the cut stump treatment. And uh, in that paper, there's references to other studies about cut stump treatments. The history of beech bark disease in North America, uh, European introduction in 1890 in Nova Scotia. Um, and then it started spreading south. It moved into uh, Maine and New Brunswick in the early 1930s. And even though this map is uh, status in 1993, I just wanted you to see the progression um, from Canada into the United States. And now it's it's much further south, as we'll see in the next photo. This is a uh, 2019 map of uh, the disease complex just in the United States. I need to get the maps from you guys and combine them. Um, it's the... Uh, Disease is an insect fungi complex where the insect damages the bark, creating an entryway for fungal inoculation. And I just wanted to show this map also to show you that the study area I'm going to be talking about are in the northwest corner of Pennsylvania. Can you see my arrow? Yes, we can. Okay, good. That's good. The uh, first part of the complex is uh, this uh, a scale insect, um, makes wounds in the bark. This is uh, the first phase of the beech bark disease complex. There's three phases that are historically recognized. So in phase one, the advancing front, this corresponds to areas recently invaded by the insect. So because when the insect is feeding, it makes fissures in the bark, and in these fissures, you can see this white, waxy material. So when, you're, when we're in the field looking for beech bark disease entering a stand, we first look for this white wax uh, complex. The nymphs are very tiny, and they're dispersed by wind. And here's a close-up of the uh, little insects, the little nymphs, and uh, the white, waxy uh, substance in the wounds. There are two types of fungi, um, and this will infect the fissures in the bark, and this starts the phase two of the complex, referred to as the killing front, and the fungi have sexual and asexual reproductive capabilities, and both of them produce spores, which again can spread. And then a fungal mycelium will grow, and that's what actually kills the bark tissue and weakens the stem as it spreads, and eventually may girdle and kill the tree. Tree mortality, stem breakage, and severe cankers are a result of this stem weakening and fungal growth. Beech trees can either die relatively quickly or become severely cankered and linger for years. Mortality of har or harvesting of diseased trees initiates root sprouting, which can create dense thickets of genetically related sprouts also susceptible to the disease. So it really perpetuates uh, that situation. Phase three of the beech bark disease is called the aftermath forest where the disease is endemic. So this would be a picture of an aftermath forest. Okay. 
Now I want to uh, shift gears and to talk about the specific study we did um, on the Allegheny National Forest in Northwestern Pennsylvania. The majority of the silviculture prescriptions on the forest follow even age management guidelines with the shelter wood system being the most common. It's primarily a deciduous um, forest, although there, there is a, um, a component of uh, Eastern hemlock and some white pine um, and you know, that can make up 20 or 30% of some of the stands, but again, primarily deciduous. So the Allegheny National Forest Shelterwood Protocol and stands with uh, dense beech understories um, is to uh, treat, sometimes treat disease beech stumps during the establishment or seed cut. Uh, they're always caught and sometimes they just are left to sprout back and other times they do treat the stumps with herbicide. Uh, we also fell non-merchantable beech and striped maple between 2.5 and 12.5 centimeters. And then typically up to two years later, after the harvest, a broadcast understory application is conducted uh, following seedbed germination. And this allows herbaceous invasion, invasion to occur and stump spreading to occur of the beach. So once you get leaves again, then you can do the broadcast spraying. Timing of the treatment is, depends on the amount of regeneration and it's, it's nice because it can be spatially adjusted to project new generation, regeneration. And the system has worked well um, and again, is very flexible because even later you can come back in with spot treatments um, to continue treating beech and other undesirables. The timing of a subsequent removal harvest depends on regeneration establishment. If you have enough diversity and the right size to re remove the overstory. So um, there have been long-term studies where beech bark disease has been followed. Um, Dave Houston did a lot of these in Maine where he would monitor stands that were, um, where the disease was endemic. And he noted that um, about one to 5% of the trees showed no sign of the disease after 20 years. And so, there was believed that there was some kind of genetic resistance to the disease, um, or it could have been related to microclimate or some clonal uh, properties where there was a resistant tree and it was cloned to another one. Um, but it brought about the concept of, of trying to retain some of these resistant beech because beech is a desirable uh, species ecologically, especially for wildlife values. So um, one other thing I guess I wanna say is that the geneticists have challenged some of these trees that uh, are visually resistant and uh, you know, where they would actually put the disease on them in these, these patches and they have been finding some genetic resistance. So the, the visual clues seem to be a good indication uh, that there might be some genetic resistance. Okay, so here's the location of the Allegheny National Forest in Northwest Pennsylvania on the, our geographic region called the Allegheny Plateau. And it has been impacted by beech bark disease for over 30 years. The advancing front has been present since the 1980s, uh, killing front since 1990. And then the aftermath forest, you can see up in the upper corner here, um, starting in 2004, there's different grades of it based on when it was infected, of course. So in some of the stands where, where beech bark disease has been endemic, um, some, some scientists from the Forest Service were monitoring uh, clean stem beaches for over 10 years. And if you look at this uh, compartment maps, these stands, all the circles are trees that were monitored um, over that time period to see if they, they got the disease or if their stems remained clean. 
Um, so from these areas in 2003, 120 clean trees were identified in eight stands. Uh, stand inventories indicated inadequate advanced regeneration due to beach uh, understory interference. So they wanted to implement a shelter wood treated treatment in these stands uh, with the typical protocol I mentioned earlier. However, managers wanted to, to, to leave the clean beach stems as a source of potentially resistant sprouts. So the question was, if we herbicide the whole understory like we normally do, um, will we set back those resistant suckers, beach sprouts um, that we want to promote? So, um, prior to um, the, the uh, spraying, we ex established uh, experimental plots around those resistant trees. And so, each circle is a 11.3 meter radius plot. Uh, that was established around each resistant, potentially resistant beach stem. And within those bigger plots, we established three smaller micro plots, um, 5.7 meters from the parent beach. And those were set up after the herbicide application, but those were used to monitor uh, regeneration. So the whole stand received broadcast understory herbicide along with the seed cut. However, experimentally in, in some of these, uh, in half of the plots, we protected all of the regeneration that was there. So all of the beach, potentially resistant beach suckers that were already there, we did not spray them. Um, and logistically it was a nightmare, but we did it. So we wanted to see if um, spraying the beach it reduced its competitive advantage compared to other species. Since we wanted to promote this um, genetically resistant sprouting, we wanted to see if herbicides set it back or not. Okay, so the stands were harvested in the winter of 2005. And uh, the stands are identified by number 13, 36, and 42. And this is just looking at the pre and post harvest residual basal area in each one of the stands. Um, you can see they're a little bit different in species composition, um, but primarily dominated by black cherry and beech um, after the, the harvest. So the harvests were completed in March of 2005. Um, herbicide was applied in August and it was applied using an air blast sprayer mounted on a tract vehicle. And the mixture was uh, glyphosate to control the woody vegetation. Oust is always added in that um, forest because there's a lot of um, herbaceous competition, especially from hay scented fern. And then ChemSurf was added uh, as a surfactant. In 2006, non-commercial stems uh, of beech and striped maple were cut because they were not removed during the harvest because it was a commercial harvest. And then we went back in and established and remeasured the regeneration subplots um, from 2005 to 2013. So uh, an eight year time span. Uh, just one other thing to mention is after the herbicide uh, was applied, um, the next year a forester went back and they just checked that the contractor did a good job um, by surveying the area. And it's considered effective if less than 30% interfering vegetation remains, including beech. Here's a, a picture of um, some of our, one of our research plots. There's the resistant uh, beech stem. This is after the harvest. 
and we were looking for sprouting. So this was one of the plots that was herbicided. And where those pink arrows are, are the um, sprouting two years later. So it, it was fine, they came back. You can see the size of it. Okay, now the statistical analysis <clears throat> used a mixed model split pot experimental design. And we were just looking at the 2013 data. Our original intent was to do a, a time series analysis where we could see how things changed over time, but the sample sizes were just not big enough. Um, when we originally set up the study, it turned out a lot of the plots had to get tossed because they couldn't get harvested because of wetland areas and, and other environmental issues. Uh, so it really re reduced the size of, of the, the study plot. But in, so in 2013, seedling data from each sub-subplot were averaged by species to account for variance within the larger subplot surrounding the entire tree. The tests for the fixed effects indicated significant standard species effects for 2013, but no significant effect for herbicide treatment or species and herbicide interaction. So I'm going to point out that the species comparison here is all species on treated and untreated plot, not just beech. And then the stands are the, the three stands were compared to look for differences. So there were there was variation among the stands and there was variation among the species composition eight years later. Okay, now you don't have to get too overwhelmed with these numbers. But um, the uh, seedlings per hectare are in parentheses. I have English and metric on this slide. So just looking at uh, the beach regeneration on all the herbicide plots and then the non-herbicide plots. And you do that for each species. Now for birch and maple, uh, we combined yellow and black birch and red maple and sugar maple. There was very little yellow birch and very little sugar maple. So I, I didn't have enough data to look at them separately. So they are combined. And black cherry um, was only present on one plot in the uh, no herbicide uh, treated stands. So I, again, there was not enough data to do any comparisons with that, but it was present in plots that were herbicided. So, the takeaway from this slide is that the predicted probabilities of black cherry on herbicide plots and maple and striped maple on no herbicide plots were not significantly different among the three stands. So cherry responded similarly to herbicide for all three stands. And striped maple and um, mostly red maple, uh, you know, didn't change from the harvest. So just um, with no overall treatment effect, we further examined regeneration density summarized by stand and species because there were stand effects. And these are all in uh, density of uh, regeneration in uh, trees per hectare. So takeaway messages for this table is that beach densities were similar for all stands except for stand 42, where um, mean treatment densities were almost double for the no herbicide plot. So the herbicide set back the beach, although there's still plenty. Um, maple on herbicide plots were double the no herbicide plots for two stands, stands 13 and 42, and similar on stand 36. Birch was scarce on untreated plots, except for stand 42, and black cherry was scarce on untreated plots, which, which makes sense. They're both uh, shade intolerant, and so without removing the competition with the herbicide, uh, they were they didn't do very well at all. So with the herbicide treatment and um, the shelter wood cut, uh, we did get regeneration of birch and black cherry.
Okay, findings. We expected less beach on the herbicide treated plots by 2013, but our data show by after eight years, there was no difference whether you uh, remove the beach and let it sprout back or, or you didn't. Um, we think that maybe uh, on the no herbicide plots, uh, the beach could have been um, outcompeted in a sense from uh, surrounding vegetation that was released because the harvest opened the stand quite a bit. Uh, but just to, to point out, our plots were not representative of the entire stand. They were just underneath one large beech tree. Um, but in 2015, the Allegheny uh, foresters went out just to do their traditional you know, regeneration inventory to see if it was time to remove the overstory. And they found that um, removal harvests are only planned if at least 70% of the plots are stocked with regeneration of desired species. So they went in and got a good assessment of the um, entire stand. And what they found is that uh, the regeneration stocking evaluations indicated that they did indeed have 70% of the plots stocked with desirable or acceptable species. and that the bee tree sprouting and a diverse cohort of new seedlings uh, were sufficient for overstory removal. Um, and so our conclusion was the beech sprouts coming from um, resistant parent trees do not need to be protected during broadcast herbicide application. So you can just treat the whole understory like you would in any uh, normal shelter would, which makes it a lot easier to uh, spray the stand without having that buffer areas. And then if you follow these stands through time, we'll have to see if retaining these visually resistant parent trees increases the proportion of resistant sprouts. Um, and one thing we did note is that the um, resistant beech tended to appear in clumps in these stands. And it could be because there was some clonal uh, connection between them. So once the regeneration uh, starts to develop more, there may be a need for some kind of pre-commercial treatments to thin out those beech sprouts uh, because they'll grow just fine with all that shade. Okay, just trying to see if there's any more points I missed. I just also wanna point out is that uh, the publication listed here at the bottom, um, which is what I'm basically reporting on here, uh, has a lot more detail and, and a lot more tables and data. And if anybody would like a copy, um, just, just send me an email and I can send you a PDF or you can just look it up. It's in the four science. And that's it.